Crime Network. We were just hearing testimony from the defendant himself in a case that we've been following out of Florida. We just heard from Adam Matos where he admits in his testimony, we heard this morning, that he killed all four people, including the mother of his young child, and he claims it was all done in self-defense and that he feared for his life. Are the jurors going to believe it? Let's bring in my host, Misty Maris, with me this afternoon, as well as Paul Henderson, who is a veteran prosecutor. He's on the line via Skype. First off to you, Misty, what do you make of this? I just couldn't believe that Matos was on the stand when I tuned in this morning. I was thinking to myself, I guess this is just the last ditch effort of the defense attorneys to save this guy's life because it is risky business putting your client on the stand from a defense perspective. And in this case, I'm not sure that this is helping him so much, this testimony that we just heard today. What do you think, Paul? You there? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Thanks for having me. I don't think they have a choice. It's clear that their defense has changed because if you look back a couple of months, even in the motions that they were filing in this case, and I went back and looked at all of the public motions, where they were still trying to get in through the in limine motions that the evidence that he had hid the bodies or moved the bodies was not proof that he had actually killed them. So it's clear that since that time, they've now shifted and their entire defense is based on this self-defense. I believe that the only reason that they're trying to assert the self-defense is to try and undermine the mens rea for the defendant to try and get out of the death penalty. That's clear this is what's going on. I mean, he was a complete disaster on the stand. And it, many times, I think he proved the case for the prosecution, Misty, that, that, he, that this was a premeditated planned thing and that he had opportunity to leave at one point. Absolutely, he had opportunity to leave, especially when Margaret Brown came home. They were not even on the, he was upstairs, she was downstairs, that he did not have to, he didn't necessarily feel he was in this imminent threat by his own words. I also think Paul brought up a great point that the jury is being asked now to believe this story. Matt Matos is on the stand asking to, that this is his credibility is on the line to be believed. Meanwhile, we know in a jailhouse interview he implicated another person. We know that he's lied to law enforcement this whole time. This isn't just proving the case. And the defense did not do an opening statement probably to see how the evidence shook out from the prosecution's exactly. perspective and now crafting their defense in the best way that they possibly can given the facts that they're dealt. So let me ask you this, Paul, how do you explain the killing of Margaret Brown uh, after all this had unfolded? He then claims she comes home in her van and he approaches her with a hammer and he's now claiming he was fearful for his life? How is that possible? Well, it's actually not. And I think that's going to be a real problem and going to be the linchpin. The actual homicide of Margaret Brown and, quite frankly, the elements associated with Nicholas Leonard as well, where he went in after he was incapacitated and beat him with a hammer. Because what he's got to do is try and present this self-defense or sell this self-defense to a jury. And even if it's an imperfect defense, it lowers the amount of the mens rea that gets him out of the death penalty. But he's got to prove that for each and every one of the murders. And you are absolutely correct. And I think Misty brought this point up accurately. With the, with the mother coming home, Margaret Brown, how do you justify killing her with that hammer? And he says in his own testimony, he said that I realize in hindsight that she wasn't trying to kill me and I may have been paranoid. But that state of paranoia doesn't justify self-defense and doesn't get him out of the death penalty at risk here in this case. And keep in mind, he's only got to lose that self-defense in one of the four homicides in order to qualify for this death penalty. So that's what it's looking like based on this testimony. He's doing a terrible job to me on the stand. I can't imagine that he's selling this story at all to this jury. So let me let me just pose this theory here. So. He comes off, he's trying to tell the jurors he's paranoid, he thinks people are gonna kill him. So isn't this perhaps a making for an insanity defense? Wouldn't have that been a better way for them to go than to put him on the stand and legitimately claim, Paul, that, that he was in fear for his life? You know, to me, based on what I'm seeing, but again, I've not spoken to this defendant to know. A lot of times you get defendants like this that refuse to allow you to assert 
mental uh, mental illness or challenges, especially if those are illnesses or challenges that they've dealt with throughout their lives. So in this case, you just got to put it on, although what a risk to put him on with testimony like this. The self-defense is just laughable. It's a terrible defense in a case like this because you have to, like I said, assert the self-defense for each and every one of those homicides. And you've got four back to back to back. And one of the people that you killed wasn't even home at the time or there yeah. when you killed the other three. So you've got to reassert it again for an unarmed woman coming home to her family. It, it's an almost impossible hurdle and it's not a very good defense in a case like this. And again, that's probably why you raised this issue. He would have done better asserting uh, mental illness at this point, though, I, you know, he's laid enough of the foundation and enough of his testimony that's going to be used against him that the writing is on the walls to me uh, from my observation. I can't imagine that a jury is interpreting this any other way. And we haven't even heard the closing arguments yet or colored all of this testimony with the fact that this was all taking place in front of your four year old child in this house that saw all of this taking place and not just the homicides but the actions afterwards to hide, obscure, and mislead everyone about the deeds that you had just engaged in in killing all these people. Uh, it's, it's not looking good. It's not looking good uh, for Mr. Mantos. Uh, so he, here's kind of what I'm thinking happened, Misty, because as we've all agree here, the why he took the stand is kind of unexplainable. My perhaps theory is the defense was hoping that they'd convince him throughout the trial not to take the stand and he was somehow being insistent that yes, I'm going to take the stand, I'm going to give my story <coughs> and that's why the defense then gave the opening statements right before they put on their case. I can't explain it otherwise. Well, it could be. It could be one of two things. The first is exactly what you said, Rachel, because ultimately no matter what advice you give your client as a defense attorney, it is their choice if they want to take the stand. You can speak all night and day about the fact that that might be a bad idea, but if they want to do it, they, you must, uh, they must do it. Uh, the other thing is, and I think in this case, it might just be a Hail Mary by the defense attorneys thinking, look, our, we're in this for the long game. We're thinking about the penalty phase of the trial. Yeah. Yes, we're, right now we're talking about the innocent, the guilt phase of the trial, but we're looking at this from the penalty phase perspective, and we want to make sure that our client doesn't get the death penalty. So in this case, the self-defense theory, while very, very weak, as Paul pointed out, might at least give them the opportunity to argue that it, one or more of these murders, one of these four at least, was not premeditated. Now, you brought up a great point about the insanity defense, but I'm not sure that was ever an option for them because of Matos's actions after the fact. He's showing that perhaps he understood the nature and consequences of his actions or that his actions were not legal by cleaning up the, the site of the murders, by selling the dogs, by uh, taking all of those affirmative acts to seemingly cover up these murders. And, and in that case, you really don't have a great insanity defense. But some of the stuff about his mental state we hear coming out in the testimony, uh, the fact that he was paranoid, you could see that in the penalty phase of the trial being presented as mitigating factors. Paul, let me ask you this and something Misty brought up. Is it harder, do you think it's harder for the jurors to put Adam Matos to death when they see him on the stand talking, when they see that he's a father talking about his son? Do you think that's what they're going for with this? I, I, I don't think so, because it's certainly not coming across. He is stoic, he is stiff, he is nonchalant uh, when they're talking about areas that should have been sensitive. When he talks about killing the mother of his child, when he talks about killing her mother and the father, all of them are just done in a way with a flat delivery that doesn't come across as very sympathetic, that doesn't come across as very empathetic if you're on a jury. This is really more an image of a sociopath. And when you couple that presentation with the evidence and the information, just like Misty said, and, and I think that that's absolutely accurate, with the information about how he behaved after he killed all four of those people and hiding and proving that he knew what he had done was wrong and he knew that he took actions to both evade the police and mislead the neighbors, family and friends with the fake story about 
how the family had moved to West Virginia. And then on top of that, used the woman that he had just murdered credit card to order pizza. None of this is leading you to sympathy. These are all issues in, mid in aggravation that are going to lead to justify exactly why the prosecution is seeking the death penalty. I think he's going to have a very hard time coming across as empathetic. He may take a flying pass at the insanity plea, but I don't think they have a realistic hope of getting there. I think if they do, it's only going to be used to try and mitigate uh, the sentence at all, to try and get away from the death penalty. And at this point, with this many homicides and the way that they were conducted, it just doesn't seem like a very strong case or a very strong foundation for them to, to rest on. And of course, Paul, the reason that Adam Mato said he uh, used that credit card and ordered that pizza was because he was just looking out for his son and that was number one on his mind and then he said that he was paranoid that if he called the cops that they'd not only kill him that they would kill his son what did you right. make of that and again none of that makes sense and I think that you try and throw something on the wall to try and get to an imperfect defense None of that sounded credible in the context of all of the other evidence and all of the other testimony. This could have sounded credible if he weren't on the stand delivering it. This is a story that should have been delivered by the defense attorney. Because once you put the defendant on the stand, I mean, it's no holds barred. You see him being eviscerated by this prosecutor who is leading him down the road and leading him down the line and getting him to admit over and over and over of the affirmative acts that he took while he was killing not one, not two, not three, but four people back to back to back. It's a terrible image for him. Those words are gonna come back and I guarantee you will hear the answer to those questions from the cross-examination that we just watched in the closing from the prosecution, both in terms of guilt and then again when it comes time for the sentencing when they argue about the death penalty because that is definitely where this case is headed. So you talked a little bit about it, Misty. Let's talk a little bit about the cross-examination. Uh, I thought the prosecutor did a really good job uh, at, at getting at this witness and cracking cracking him. What did you think? I thought the prosecution did an excellent job, but I will say I was a little surprised at the length. I actually thought we were going to be sitting here for another couple of hours parsing yeah. through more of these facts and really, really chipping away at, at what we heard during the direct examination. But I do think the prosecution took a very good tactic. They went through each individual victim, which is what they have to do because realistically, these are looked at, while well, this all happened on one day, you have to prove with respect to the self-defense theory that you were in this imminent fear in each individual situation with each individual victim. So they did a great job there. Another thing I thought the prosecution did brilliantly was bringing up some of the acts that happened earlier in the day. Now we know that Matos had called Megan Brown hundreds of times, that she had called the police advising that he had held her up with a, a knife to her neck. Now you're talking about a little bit of aggravation, initial aggressor type theory that the prosecution is laying the foundation for before we even get to the house later that day. So that's all very, very tactical decisions by the prosecution. I will say, if it were me standing there, I would have gone into a lot more detail with the aftermath because yes. I think it is really telling the way that this guy responded to killing four people if this is truly self-defense. This should be someone who's completely distraught. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. I was in such fear for my life that it was a necessity. But I'm going to yeah. grab a pizza and I'm going to be I'm worried about these dogs and and and, and this and that, I, I would have really focused on that fact because I think to a jury, that's compelling stuff. Paul? Yeah, I also would have jumped in and played out a little bit more or fleshed out a little bit more uh, his duty to withdraw mm. in each and every one of these instances. So even though you had shot him, the fact that you went back, got a hammer and hit him more, you didn't withdraw. These are all elements defining what self-defense can or cannot be. And that way, when you argue at the get death and the at the penalty phase and at the guilt phase as well, you can show how you are not allowed to believe that this is self-defense because of these factors and because of this testimony. So I wanted to hear a little bit more about the duty to withdraw, both with Nicholas Leonard 
and the duty to not engage and to be the assaulter with Margaret Brown, even if he thought she would want to kill him, because that's unreasonable. And an unreasonable defense for self-defense is an imperfect defense, which gets you out of the affirmative act for first defense uh, homicide. But I don't think that we got this here. And I wanted a little bit more uh, from the prosecutor there. But I think he did a really good job of leading the defendant and forcing him to answer affirmatively as to what he did that was inappropriate uh, in most of the murders. But I, I will say I was surprised as well that with the defendant on the stand for four homicides, that the cross-examination lasted uh, in the short amount of time that it did. I would have kept him on the stand for a longer time, if for no other reason than to get more evidence to use against him uh, moving forward when we start talking about the penalty phase. One thing, though, that as we dissect this and talk about this case that we really can't lose sight of is the fact that this four-year-old little boy was there when this all unfolded and uh, the prosecution during cross-examination addressed that a bit, asking Adam Matos where this boy was. Uh, apparently he was locked in his bedroom, but I can only yeah. imagine uh, the horror. I mean, he was four years old, so who knows if he even understood what's going on, but hearing those gunshots, hearing the screams, right. uh, hearing what happened, um, and I'm sure that's going to certainly weigh heavy in the jurors' hearts as they think it, about what happened. Well, more than weighing heavily, you're going to hear all of that testimony again. And the reason that you didn't hear a whole lot of conversations about the four-year-old other than establishing that he's in the house is because you don't know the answer to those questions, right? And you don't want to hear from the defendant that he was doing things that showed concern or that paint him as empathetic for the child. It's better to just raise that issue, flag that balloon, and then come back to it and interpret and paint your own picture for the jury when you're talking about the guilt or innocence, or paint your own picture when you're talking about the sentencing, about what that may have looked like or may have felt like for that kid that was in the house during this whole incident as it's unfolding. You don't ever wanna start asking too many questions about things that you don't know the answer to Right. And there's no one that can answer those questions unless you put the kid on the stand. And as a four year old, as a prosecutor, you, you don't really want to be in that situation. You've got enough of the information there. It's better to dance around that or leave it open for your own interpretation so you can paint your own picture to the jury of how sympathetic that must have been in opposition to what the defendant is trying to sell. And at one point when they were discussing the child, the prosecution, prosecutor even said, you're just making stuff up now. Oh, we yeah. heard that. I think I wrote that quote <laughs> yeah. down yeah. because I, I was, I thought the prosecutor did a good job of that's a quote that's going to stick in the jury's mind. But yep. you're absolutely right. Really, the defense and, and Matos, when he's on the stand, he's talking about after the fact he wanted, why did he clean up? Well, he wanted to protect his son from seeing something so horrible. Why did he take this money? Well, he wanted to make sure that his son could be fed. Meanwhile, you had the opportunity to get out of there and four people are dead with your son in the house. So oh, this is truly point. something that, the, that they're going to capitalize on in closing arguments. Absolutely. The, you know what I was just going to say? Because Misty brought up a, an excellent point. To the degree you were trying to protect your child, you could have taken that child out of the home after you killed three people and a fourth person would have been alive but you kept that child in the house for Margaret Brown to come back and then you killed her too. I mean, it, it just, it, it's all bad for how he behaved with the kid. I love too when the defendant said, now, now you're just making things up. And I would play that back to that jury in the closing argument and say, I pointed it out to you. This doesn't make sense. And if it does make sense, the only way that you can believe it is if you also believe that this is a killer, that he doesn't have remorse, that he acted with intentionality, he knew what he was doing, and here's all the evidence that proves it. That's exactly why he made those statements and exactly why he was asking the questions the way that he did to establish that the kid was there and aware and around in the timeline indicating that he could have left the home, he could have left the kid locked somewhere else, and a fourth person might be alive I think he's going to come back to that when it comes time for the guilt or innocence phase. Those are great insights, Paul. 
That was Paul Henderson. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for breaking down this crazy day where Matos, the defendant, actually took the stand in trial. We know that court is reconvening around 2.15 this afternoon, coming back from lunch. In the meantime, we're going to review the direct testimony of Matos while we wait to see what else is in store in this Florida courtroom.